Do you need a hero? Do you have a hero? I don't know if you've seen the, um, the animated film, The Incredibles. Uh, it begins with a crisis, a whole generation of superheroes whom society has no need for anymore. In fact, people start suing superheroes because they don't want to be rescued. Thank you very much. So all the heroes go and live quiet, if slightly frustrating lives in suburbia with tedious office jobs and complicated family lives. I think that's a profound cultural comment. We live in a cynical age, one that doesn't seem to have any room for real heroes. We have a, a popular culture instead that is saturated with celebrities. There's something different. Someone famous only for being famous somehow. And we delight to tear them down rather than build them up. Shelves full of magazines, full of stories, full of sex scandals and lies and mistakes. We seem more interested in people's flaws rather than anything noble that we might seek to, to praise or to emulate. However, however, if the recent uh, spate of uh, comic book adaptation blockbuster movies is anything to go by, there's still something in us that is really fascinated with the idea of the hero. We still have a fascination with the illusion of one singularly determined and specially empowered figure that could rid the world of injustice or crime or, or rescue us from certain disaster. We're still interested in the hero. And heroes can do uh, at least two things for us. Firstly, they shape what we want to become like. Uh, for Christmas, I was given a, a present, which was um, some of the, early, the earliest Superman comics, which have been re-released. Uh, and I discovered at the back that you get these lifting exercises uh, for young children. So you have diagrams of little Johnny lifting these cans. Uh, and the promise at the bottom, you too can be like Superman one day, which I think is rather a cruel trick to play on little children. But, but there it was. Heroes shape what we want to become like, don't they? They capture our imagination, and we want to emulate them, their values, their determination, what they can do. But secondly, heroes do something else. They do what we could never do, what we could never hope to do, and we love them for it. So when you watch the Superman films, you cheer along with the crowds, Whenever his theme tune plays and he appears and soars through the sky and stops the train from falling off the rails or stops buildings from falling on people. It's not so much at that point that you want to be Superman, you're just very, very glad that he's around to save the day. The feeling that there's someone there to protect us, someone there to rescue us. We love a hero like that. You see the same thing with the, the enduring myth of the knight in shining armor on the white steed that every princess deep down longs would come and rescue them. There's still a fascination with a hero. And in front of us in 1 Samuel 17, we have the story of an emerging hero. And before we look at the relevance of this story to our lives as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, first just I want us to enter into and just enjoy the story. Let's enjoy the story. The story begins with a battle, the army of God's people on one hill, a Philistine army on the opposite hill, and this silent dead valley between them. And with all good hero stories, there's a villain. There's an enemy. As was common practice in the ancient Near East, one champion stands out from the crowd to challenge someone else to a duel. And this man was huge. He was enormous. And if you were a member of the Israelite army, wouldn't you have quaked in your boots at the description in verses 4 to 7? Look at it with me. A champion named Goliath who was from Gath, came out from the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. 
He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his leg he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Those verses are made to make you tremble. He's almost made of metal. You would feel pretty uncomfortable if you met him down a dark alley in Bournemouth on a dark night. Not only is he huge, he's also understandably pretty confident. In verse 10, then the Philistine said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. Now, normally, if you were in the army of Israel, you would put confidence in your king at this point. And King Saul was known for being tall, but he wasn't quite nine foot. And we read in verse 11, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Things don't look good. Things don't look good. With enemies like Goliath around, it's easy to feel impotent. And the armies of God, the armies of God's people are petrified into paralysis. What happens next? Who can stand up to the likes of Goliath? Will God's people trust him? Will anyone dare take on this man? We cut to another scene. A boy named David emerges from obscurity. And we love a hero, don't we, that emerges from obscurity. All the best heroes do. Verse 12, now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was old and well advanced in years. And that sentence, if you've been reading through the book of 1 Samuel up to this point, looks slightly odd, because it looks like a fresh introduction to David. But if you've been reading through 1 Samuel, you've already met David, you've already seen in the last chapter that he is God's choice for the new king of his people. You've already seen him anointed with oil. You've already seen him being filled with the Spirit of God, who is giving him the power to lead and rule as God's king over his people. And although we should already know where this story is heading, David will not be officially enthroned in Israel till quite a few chapters' time. We're let into the secret. But in this account here in chapter 17, we're introduced to him afresh. And I think that has the effect of placing us in the situation of everybody else in Israel who don't know David from Adam. They don't think anything of David yet. He seems just like an extra in the story. He's the errand boy who fetches the sandwiches. Little do you realize that he is going to be the star of the show. And what's driving David? What forces him into the limelight? Well, the first words that he speaks give it away. In verse 26, David asked the man, men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? We love heroes who stand for truth. We love heroes who stand for justice. We even occasionally love heroes who stand for the American way. But David stands for a much, much higher value. He stands for the glory and the honor of the living God. The glory and the honor of the living God. That's the problem with Goliath. That's what makes him the enemy. He defies the armies of the living God. And that's always what marks out the enemies in the Bible, all the way through. Whether individual men like Goliath here, whether huge empires like Babylon or Assyria, whether the demonic realm and the devil himself. The enemies in the Bible are always God's defiers, the God's people taunters. And when that honor is attacked, David, for one, gets mad. He has a how dare he attitude. 
uh, who does he think he is attitudes. David's brothers are asking David who he thinks he is, but David has God's perspective. See, this isn't only a story about how you defeat your enemies. No, before that, it's a story about how you pick them. Who are the real enemies in this world? And here David picks Goliath as his personal enemy because of the insult to the Lord, his God. On one level, I find myself slightly agreeing with Goliath. Israel's armies are a bit useless at the moment, aren't they? They may be the armies of the living God, but they're not trusting him. They're they're very easy to mock, aren't they? But you see, God in his great grace condescends to attach his own name, his own reputation to a people who are not worthy of it. And how dare anybody insult anything that bears that name? David is concerned for the glory and honor of God. He's also interested in reward. Look at verse 26 again. He asks, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine? And he gets the reply, a wife and tax benefits. What more could you ask for? And I think that the commentators are interesting. They try to duck this issue, but it seems plain to me. David is after a reward. He wants a reward. And you want the hero to be rewarded, don't you? We always want heroes to be rewarded. You want him to rescue the damsel in distress and then to marry her. You want his service to be recognized and honored by the people. David is after a reward. So with the passion of God's honor burning in his heart and the interest in this great reward, he approaches Saul and takes, uh, Saul takes some persuading. David says that he's encountered similar things in his day job uh, as the shepherd, uh, and eventually Saul is worn down, and uh, he gives in. And the soundtrack is playing, and the orchestra is increasing in volume and is stirring your emotions and the tension is building as David dons the armor for the first time. And then there's, there's like a, a kind of squeaky scratch as the needle is kind of ripped off the record because David can't even stand up in the armor. He kind of wobbles around for a bit and then he takes the whole outfit off again and your heart sinks. After all this brave talk from David, this does not look good. This does not look good. Goliath is practically made of metal. David can't stand up in a few pieces of armor. Instead, he goes as the simple shepherd boy, staggering, full of resolve towards his foe. But to our eyes, he looks like a lamb going to the slaughter. This tiny kid, he's completely lost in the shadow of this massive ogre. And Goliath's feeling quite insulted after 40 days of taunting. Is this the best that the Israelites can come up with? In verse 42, read it with me. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistines cursed David by his gods. But one smooth stone. One fling from a sling, and one gigantic, God-defying enemy completely defeated. And as Goliath falls with a thud, maybe his last thought is something like, hmm, this has never happened before. And David conquers through apparent weakness. We wouldn't have thought it, but victory is shown through such weakness. And David's victory, the victory of the one man, belongs to the whole of God's people. Goliath's challenge has been answered, and the victory is in principle won at that point. More than that, it gives God's people confidence to fight. Now they know that God is for them and with them. If this victory can be won through such uh, a weak boy, then surely God is with them. And now they know victory is sure, Now they know the boot is on the other foot. And so you read uh, in verse uh, 52, when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead and turned and ran, 
Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath, to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sharaim road to Gath and Ekron. They plunder the Philistines. There's no stopping them now. The victory has already been won. And finally, they think God's people have a hero. Someone to fight for us, someone to protect us, someone to rescue us. And from then on, David's fame spreads throughout the land. Everyone wants to join his fan club. Everybody wants to follow David. It's a story, great story. So what? So what? What is God saying to us this evening through this story? What is God communicating to his people? God paints with history. God uses history to communicate to us his big story. And God is speaking through this story to reveal to us the real hero, the true hero. As through the centuries, people start to hope for and long for another David, only better. And as prophets start to promise another David, only better. Someone with David's attitude, someone with David's success, someone who does what David did, only much, much better. Their story gives us an expectation of a real hero, the son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. A hero who, just like David, has an enemy, chiefly a powerful supernatural enemy who appears early on in the plot of the Gospels, a God-defying power known as the devil or Satan, who also taunts for 40 days Jesus in the desert. Jesus is a hero who, just like David, emerges from obscurity, being born in a stable, growing up in a disreputable northern town, arriving in history without all the fireworks and the red carpet that you might expect. A hero who, just like David, is first filled with the Spirit of God to be king and will eventually be enthroned at God's right hand as king, but between these two events faces a colossal battle. He's a hero who, just like David, is motivated chiefly by the honor and the glory of God. Yes, he's also motivated by compassion and for love for, for those who are harassed and helpless, as we were thinking this morning. But don't miss that, more importantly, Jesus has this passion for the honor of his Father in heaven. Let me read to you. This is John 17, verses 1 to 4. Jesus praying, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Jesus is a hero consumed by the right sort of passion. He's a hero also like David who's motivated by rewards. So Hebrews 12 verse 2 says this, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we're told there that the reason that Jesus went through the cross, the reason he was motivated enough is that he can see joy at the other side. Joy at what he had achieved in dying. What is Jesus' reward? Jesus' reward is us, Christians, those who trust him, whom he will save and transform to be like himself multitude of rescued rebels from every nation on earth. Not because we deserve it, quite the opposite. But Jesus delights in this, that undeserving rebels be transformed into younger, 
brothers who are like him. Jesus is motivated by God's glory and he's motivated by reward. And when you put those two things together, that does something revolutionary to our understanding of the Christian message, the gospel. It makes it less selfish and more secure. Less selfish and more secure. Sometimes as Christians, we're, we're in danger of having the attitude that, you know, Jesus came for me and he died for me and he loves me and it's me, me, me. But here we see if the, if the Christian message is all about how the Son glorifies the Father and how the Father glorifies and rewards the Son, then I drop out of the center of the gospel. The gospel is less selfish and more secure. See, if my salvation is my reward for my faith, then I'm always thinking, how much faith do I have? Is that enough? But if my salvation is, is Jesus' reward for his obedience in going to the cross, and we already know that God is more than satisfied with him, then Jesus is our hero, and we are his reward if we trust in him. Jesus is a hero. Jesus is a hero who, just like David, conquered through apparent weakness. The one who actually did go as a lamb to the slaughter, who died on a foolish wooden cross outside a city, who bore the punishment of our gods, of all the God defiance that we have thrown against him, and he bore that punishment in our place. And through that act, that weak, foolish act to all observers, he defeated evil, supernatural powers, more scary and gigantic than a thousand Goliaths. Jesus is our hero. He's a hero who just, like David, doesn't just win a personal victory at that point, but one that belongs to all of his people. He's a hero who, just like David, fills God's people to fight with confidence. Not that we go around throwing stones at tall people. I urge you not to do that. But we can begin to overcome the powers of darkness, as he did, through a sacrificial life of compassion lived for the glory of God. The victory is won, it's sure. Now we know that God is for us, and who can stop us? If Satan is doomed, who can stop us? We have a hero. And if we have this view of Jesus, then there are three applications. Two things if you're a Christian, and one if you're not uh, yet a Christian. Two things for a Christian. One, we will adore him, and two, we will seek to imitate him. We will adore him, because he has done what we could never do. And we will seek to imitate him, because he's captured our hearts and our imagination. And you've got to get those two the right way around. That's how it works with heroes. So if you go to school playgrounds, and uh, there's a kid who's running around holding his duffel coat out like a cape, and he's wearing underpants on top of his trousers, and you stop him and you say, what do you think you're doing? He's not likely to say somebody told him that this was the right way to behave. Something of his adoration and his admiration for Superman has probably captured his heart and his ima imagination. So he wants to copy him in some small way. And for us, we will never live like Jesus just because we're told it's the right thing to do. No, we will become like him as we gaze on him, as we meditate on how amazing a hero he is. And as I dwell deeply on the triumph of Jesus, the triumph that I could never have hoped to achieve, then I'll start to discover there's all sorts of little triumphs in my own life against sin and against the devil's work. So as I adore and praise my champion Jesus, I want to live like him, to stand for the same things that he stood for, and even to suffer for God's glory in hope of certain rewards. We need a hero, and we have one, the Lord Jesus Christ, our triumphant Savior and King. If you wouldn't call yourself a Christian this evening, then you need to know that just like in our story, there's a battle 
going on. There's a battle, and it's not the battle between liberal democracy uh, and uh, Islamic terrorists. That's not the real battle. The battle is between all those who would defy God, the creator of the universe, all the supernatural powers and everyone under their control on one hill. And then on the other hill, there's those who trust in our great hero, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nobody in the valley. You can't sit around in the valley. You're on one side or the other. And one side has already been decisively defeated. And if you're not a Christian this evening, do you realize you've picked the wrong side? And it's not too late to switch sides. Will you put your trust in the hero? Will you switch sides and stand for what he stands for? Will you turn from your rebellion against him, your God defiance, and will you trust him as your hero? You can do that this evening. Turn to him, cry out to him for mercy, and you will have joy and great rewards in spending eternity with him. He's our hero, the Lord Jesus Christ, our triumphant savior king. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for sending your son to come as our champion, as the victor over all the powers of darkness. Thank you that he is now at your right hand, ruling over the universe, with all enemies being put under his feet. Thank you that one day even death will be brought under his feet and that we will live with you in him. I just pray for any who are on the wrong side of the valley this evening. Those who've sided by the way that they live and the way that they act and the way that they speak to defy you who love them so much. I pray that you might bring them by your grace from one side of the valley to the other. And they might trust in Jesus even this evening. We ask it in your great name and so that you might be magnified and worshipped and honoured. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand and praise our great, triumphant Saviour King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is King, and I will extol him, give him the glory, and honour his name. He reigns on high, now enthroned in the heavens. Word of the Father, exalted for us. He's our hero. Let's stand and sing to the glory of God.
Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ came into this world, that he was born in humble circumstances and died a terrible death and then rose again victorious. We thank you that the victory has been won. Thank you that salvation is available. Thank you that we can be on the victory side. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for his love for you and his love for us. Thank you for his great work. And thank you that he can meet with us exactly where we are here this evening. Wash away our sin. Breathe life and peace into our souls and bring us into a living, saving relationship with you. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We pray that you would open our eyes to see that he is Lord. We pray that you would open our hearts to trust in him completely and work in our wills that we are totally committed and submitted to him. And now we pray that his grace might be with us that the love of God might be upon us and that the fellowship of the Holy Spirit might be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.